Christopher Nolan's 12th film, Oppenheimer, just hit theaters. Let's rank his entire filmography with special guests, the Popcorn Podcast. Hello, podcast listeners. Welcome to this crossover episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast and the Popcorn Podcast. You got me, James, Anthony, we got Tommy, we got Ryan, and we're going to break down and rank Christopher Nolan's filmography. And the Popcorn Boys came into LA there in studio with us at our home in our recording studio. How are you doing, guys? It's nice to have you here in person. Doing great. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah you no. came just for the show, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, for us. Yeah. definitely. Just wanted to see these guys, just for you guys. But, well, um, your no. show's awesome, so it's so nice to have you guys, again, like Eddie said, in person. So excited to do this. Uh, tell our listeners where they can find your show. Uh, you can find us everywhere you find podcasts. Uh, Spotify, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, YouTube, where we don't do as well, but that's fine. Um, we got TikTok, which we're actually starting to get a little bit of a following on is nice um but yeah you can find us anywhere i think we're probably the best film podcast in the world <laughs> you're get out of here, <laughs> get out of here. At all. Yeah. youtube's tough for everyone yeah it's my hard. mom tells me all the time how good our podcast is so i feel like i'm doing <laughs> hey, great our mom was our first listener too so i get it i don't yeah. think my mom was my first <laughs> <listener>. <laughs> she still doesn't even listen <laughs> yeah she doesn't actually listen what do you do <laughs> <laughs> all right well popcorn podcast listeners we've been on their show a few times you can find us anywhere we're very easy to find raiders of lost podcast search that on any platform or RaidersOfLostPodcast.com. We love to share the audiences and everyone discover each other. And this is going to be a lot of fun. Share the load. Share, share everything. So <laughs> Nolan's made 12 movies, boys. He's just been a favorite filmmaker of mine since I was a kid. Ever yeah. since I saw, I guess, Batman Begins was my exposure yeah. to him, I feel like. Maybe. Memento. Yeah. And then just we were hooked on him ever since then. So for him... And for me, growing up as a film lover, he's always been top tier director. Like whenever one of his movies came out, we were always there opening night. It's just been like that since the early days. And he's an incredible filmmaker. I will say I was actually a big Nolan Nolan hater. Really? Bro, really? I mean, like years and years and years. Like The Dark Knight, everyone knows, considered one of the greatest superhero movies. That could probably is the best superhero movie ever. Yeah, no, I always was like, oh, he can make good visuals, but the story's never there. And like, I stuck by that probably until I just rewatched all of them these last like ten days. You watch, you watch the prestige. You were like, oh yeah, I might be wrong about that. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa! We'll hear my thoughts oh. when we get to the. <laughs> we'll get into it, but we'll I mean, prestige. Nolan's meant so much to me as well. He's one of my favorite filmmakers. His movies are maybe my most watched of any director out there. I mean, between him and Tarantino, those are probably my most watched directors, but I think Nolan has the edge. I think his movies are insanely rewatchable. He uh, connects with the audience like nobody else with these massive big bu budget blockbusters that also feel very intimate in like indie films at the same time. He's just a legend. He's one of the best filmmakers and most important filmmakers we have in terms of preservation of film and obviously making IMAX such a normal thing in our lives now. I love the guy, but Ryan, what do you think about Nolan? I agree. I mean, he's one of the best filmmakers, not only of like our generation, but probably of all time at this point. I mean, he's really just cemented his spot as one of the greats. I would say that's a, I totally agree, because I think after Oppenheimer, because he's always been a great, mm. but after Oppenheimer, he really is like in the conversation of like the titans of cinema. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for this century, the 21st century, you could argue he is the most definitive director of the century, because not only has he made amazing films, but he actually redefined the blockbuster, yep. and he just made a, a biopic that nobody's ever seen before, and he, re, and he reinvented the war picture too, so... In a way, he's the most impactful director of this century, and it's hard to argue against that. You can totally. talk about him in the same conversation as Kubrick now. Now you can, you know, I think yeah. that's really important. Obviously, people always are, I have recency bias, I think, halfway through someone's career. They're always like, oh, he's the best ever. But like now, I think yes. officially, he's in that ballpark of yes. like all-time great directors after Oppenheimer though, and after 12 movies. And I think directors, they need to make a good number of films. Like a, mo a, a young director maybe have made three films, and people are like, they're the best ever. It's like... Pump you know the how many directors have made three movies? Pump the brakes. <laughs> a lot. Films have been getting made for 120 years. Let's. I think that 12 movies. It's such a great um, list of films to really judge a director by. And I think if you, you you can judge them for greatness after six or seven, like in terms of all time greatness. And he's just had that consistency that very few directors have ever ever had in history. And I think 12 movies. They're all incredible, and some of them are the best ever. And, He's without a doubt like the greatest modern director. And anybody that can pull that many A list celebrities for one single movie, I mean. Oscar winners yeah. for one scene? Yeah, <laughs> that's wild. <laughs> Crazy. Everybody Absolutely just insane. wants to work with the guy. So 
Now, before we get into the rankings, how about we each say what our favorite Christopher Nolan movie is? Because I think these rankings are going to be just what we think are his best in terms of like kind of an objective bias sort of versus like my favorite Nolan ranking would be completely different than what I think his best movies are. So maybe for sure. What's what's everyone's favorite Christopher Nolan movie? I'll go first. It's Interstellar, baby. I love it. I adore it so much. I got a poster over there. The music, the soundtrack. We've done like four episodes on it. I, I love that film. I get to go with. That's a good question. Just what's your favorite one? I mean, instinctually, I got to go Dark Knight. Um, that was a major part of my life, getting into movies. And the Dark Knight's impact on me was so substantial that I just can't help but say, like, my gut feeling is just Dark Knight is the one for me, favorite. It might be recency bias, but Oppenheimer was just so goddamn good. <laughs> I mean, every single scene, no matter who was in it and who just randomly showed up, everybody, everybody stole the show from each other. And the writing was amazing. It looked incredible. And just, again, the fact that Nolan does everything in camera as much as possible, and he just decided to make a nuke and blow it up. <laughs> like, I mean, the dude just has no limits. So I think that's, I, I think it is my favorite one. It's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, mine is either The Dark Knight, because I think it had the biggest impact on my life and like superhero movies in total, or Tenant, which I know is a, not everyone's favorite, but I have always adored Tenet. We love Tenet in this house. Okay, good. We love good, Tenet. Good. Uh, yeah, no, I love Tenet. I saw it. The f it was the first thing I did when I came back from uh, basic training, so I just have a lot of fond memories, and I just love the movie. We actually drove to San Diego to see it because it was the only theater open in California during the lockdowns. So we drove two hours to see Tenet, and it was worth it. Two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. <laughs> it was. It was. I'd do it again. The Red it, Robin before was great too. Yeah, we got Red <laughs> Robin before. But I, I actually, I think the movie does get a lot of hate because it's uh, hard to grasp for the average audience member. But I, I think that movie's brilliant. All right, let's get into our rankings. Let's do it. This should be fun. And how about we'll just go in a circle? Maybe Anthony goes first, and we'll go counterclockwise. I would down, love to go down the first, list. Yeah. We'll go, I guess, from we're gonna do all twelve, including following, including following. Yeah. All right, it's so a feature we'll, film, yeah. We'll go bottom up for everybody. Or do you think we should do like what we did with the Real Talk Boys, where we did the bottom like six, and then oh yeah, let's do bottom five. But okay, so everyone will go one at a time. Do your bottom five. So this isn't a seventeen-hour episode yeah. because yeah. it would be. And then we'll do the rest individually. I like that down idea. Line. It worked out really well last time. Cool yeah, with everybody. Let's do it. You listeners in. Cool. All right, cool. They're in. They're in. Antonio. <laughs> okay, my bottom five. Now, I still, I mean, it's hard to rank them. It doesn't mean you don't like a movie, really. It's just all of his movies. I adore all of his movies. But to rank them, I have at number 12, Following, which is a really fantastic debut film. He shot that for $6,000 over the weekends with his friends. It's been available on the Criterion channel for a while, and, and it's just been bouncing around Max and Amazon Prime if you haven't seen it. But it's a great mystery. It showed the the early signs of what he liked to do as a storyteller really brilliantly and he shot it himself by hand with film next up insomnia which is a fantastic remake of the swedish film uh the stella skarsgård actually stars in the original film um but it's a great thriller great mystery al pacino and um, robin williams are fantastic hillary swink in an early role but i love the tone it showcased how well he can establish a dark tone gray tone but also pull you as an audience memento I think it's one of his most impressive screenplays. Never seen anything like it before. I find it to be a very fascinating film. And when you watch it still on repeat viewings, you're still like kind of taking apart the puzzle. And it just, you can look at it in so many different ways. And it's just such a brilliant film. And Memento is what got him the job with Insomnia. So it was, a, it was really important for his career for Memento to work. And then Batman Begins, I have at number nine, 12, 11, 10, nine. I love Batman Begins. But honestly, I like Dark Knight Rises more. Like, whoa! Yeah, I do. <laughs> I love Dark Knight Rises. So Hot take. I, I, I gotta go. Batman Begins over it. But I do think that you know, for us, it was our first Nolan exposure. Seeing this Batman film as like a fifteen-year-old, fourteen-year-old was mind blowing. I love the score. It's one of my most listened to scores from Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard. Really terrific opening act. The first forty minutes is just the best forty minutes in a superhero film. I think, in my opinion. And then at number eight, I have Tenet. I was just saying earlier, I think it's brilliant. I love the film. I think it's really genius, the themes he put into it, the technology, the science behind it all. I don't find it confusing once you figure it out. It's actually pretty streamlined. Um, the cast is fantastic. The filmmaking's insane, propulsive action. And I was just mouth, mouth agape most of the time during these action sequences. It's just a flat-out, incredible action sci-fi film. 
Hey, it's a really good list. I'm Thanks, surprised man. you have a mento so low. I surprised myself, but too. But again, I mean, there's no wrong list, and it's almost an impossible for yours. list. It's an impossible <laughs> list to make that yeah. will please everybody. No one's going to like everyone's yeah, list. So you got to ruffle some feathers, I think, when we do this. Did so, I ruffle your feathers? A little bit. <laughs> no, yeah. I know I ruffled your feathers with Batman Begins. You weren't expecting we're that. We're going to throw hands later. It's we're going to talk about that later. It's the think. second half. It's the second half. Batman just... Begins was a rough one. I, I didn't like that take. <laughs> oh, man. Not at all. Um, so starting from the bottom, I have Insomnia, which is the only one of Nolan's films now that I don't enjoy. I didn't like at all. I just, I didn't like the tone. I felt like it could have been darker. That could just be my, my, how I like things. I like darker stories. I like, I think that's why I love Fincher so much. And, but I will say Robin Williams gives one of my favorite performances as a killer in any movie. But I think Al Pacino, he, I think he phoned it in. I, I, I love the guy. I just, yeah, I just don't, I couldn't, I couldn't really get behind him in that one. But yeah, it's it's fine. It's just yeah, it wasn't wasn't a huge fan. But now, then going to eleven, I had the following or just following. The following is Kevin Bacon. Uh, following, which I actually really enjoyed. I was really surprised at how good it was for being a debut film, and seeing that he shot it just on the weekends for over I think he said over a year, just with him and his friends. And the one actor, the main, the not the main guy, the side character, his friend, the thief, mm. incredible. And the guy's never done a movie since then. And I actually genuinely loved his performance. So I enjoyed the movie. It's definitely not his best work, but it was also his first film. And then this is where I start to get in trouble. Uh, I have Dunkirk oh, now. Oh, which... that, hurt, that hurts me. <laughs> that hurts me. Yeah, how's Everyone it feel? Calm down. Calm down. It only gets worse from here. But um, I hated Dunkirk for years and years and years. It's been out. It was came out twice. Years that's, and years. That's, that's a long time for life. Me. I've just had was, a vendetta against going the Dunkirk. Future. It just came out I'm five years ago. Decades for decades. <laughs> half of it. My whole half life half I've hated it. Dunkirk. I'm a child. Remember that. I'm not as old as you guys. We are. We are aging. Yeah, you're, no, you're, you're, you're 11, so half your life. Yeah, you've exactly. Hated. Exactly. No, but I, I think I always had this weird feeling towards PG-13 war movies, but then I watched it again. I watched it with Ryan recently. And I actually did enjoy it a lot more than I did the first time. But from here on out, all the movies kind of blend together where I can rank them. It's just in the moment where I think they land. But it is much better than I remember it being originally. I give him all the credit for that. And he really showed like the horrors of war and all that kind of stuff with the sound editing, hearing people screaming. And he did it without really seeing people get shot or anything like that, which is very unique to filmmaking, especially with war films. It's actually, I agree, it gets better on rewatches. Yeah. So it makes sense that you liked it better the second time really upset about um i have interstellar <laughs> at this <laughs> this spot sorry what <laughs> you're like whoa whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm just kidding. hey man no. no list is wrong <laughs> yeah but um i was explaining this before the episode i had a great watch this time around because i got to watch it with a girl that i really like oh, oh really did nice. you even watch it it was <laughs> <laughs> he, did a, he did a nolan and I'll chill sh- move i'll show you my wormhole <laughs> <laughs> my mother's listening to this s-t-a-y <laughs> I, I love the Nolan this. and chill move. The Nolan I'm and like chill praying move. she doesn't listen to this episode. <laughs> I'll tell her don't. <laughs> don't sh- <laughs> but uh, no, again, I did not like this movie like the first time I watched it. So again, I realized I was wrong. This movie is beautiful. Matthew McConaughey is great in it. Every performance is very good. Not as good as the other ones. Or maybe I don't enjoy them as much. And as I said, every one of these films, films blends together at this point. So it's not that I hate it. So I don't want anyone to throw hands at me once no, these I mean, cameras you put it at the off. bottom. <laughs> yeah, you put it at what eight or nine? I'm yeah, just kidding. It's not terrible. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Uh huh. Uh-huh. James is crying like Cooper watching. <laughs> He's the crying. He's like not facing the He's camera. He's like Cooper and is watching. But, uh, the I haven't stopped making eye contact yeah. with him since. <laughs> He's just clutching the chair <laughs> like he wants to break. <laughs> Someone better hold me back. Yeah, I'm Russell Crowe in, in L.A. Confidential. <laughs> Sick I haven't seen you blink since I said it either. It's really starting to freak me out. But uh, yeah, that that's my. You look like Patrick Bateman in the business card scene. <laughs> it's freaking me out. <laughs> it even has a watermark. Actually, I had a similar experience because I saw past lives with a lovely woman, and I think that enhanced my experience. Just like it enhanced your experience. It did enhance my experience because she really enjoyed it, and she had never seen it before. And I was doing the rewatch of this, so it was nice because I was she enjoyed. Like, it, that's all that matters, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh, you haven't seen Interstellar? I just happen to have to watch it this week before I go to California. And she's like, oh, that's great. Let's watch it. I was like. Perfect. So um, <laughs> let's hope she doesn't listen to this episode. <laughs> That'd be a weird way to find out. But yeah, that was that was mine. You're that was your five. Cool. That was my five. Yeah. Bottom five. What you got? 
So I have, starting with 12, and I know you made it sound like you like this movie a lot. I didn't love it. It's the prestige. I have it last place. Whoa! I just I'm leaving. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Hot it, take, Sydney. I know, I know. I just That's I couldn't the hottest take I've ever heard. <laughs> I just couldn't get it like when I was watching it, I was just watching two guys putting on different facial hair and shooting each other. What kind and of movie was this? <laughs> <laughs> I was just watching it like, is this just gonna be the whole movie? And it, it did get better throughout. It it's definitely not a bad movie. But I think I watched it um, Thursday night before we left, so I was super tired anyway. So it might just be like a bad watching experience. But also, at the end, and spoiler alert, when Bale gets hung and he says, any last words, I was watching the TV and I sarcastically went, abracadabra. <laughs> he goes, abracadabra. I just lost it. I started cracking Was it your up. first watch of it? It was, yeah. Okay, so some sometimes Nolan movies, they can be overwhelming, yeah. like Tenet, like um, Dunkirk, um, and I think it, like Oppenheimer. But I've heard they, it's much they, better. They were, on the it gets so rewarding on repeat viewings. Mm -hmm. Like it's a movie that's very intricate. Yeah. And I guarantee it might change your mind. It, like over the next couple of years, if you give it a few more watches, Definitely. you might really appreciate it more. Yeah. I, it, it is yeah. one that I want to watch again, as well as the next one, which is the one I also watched for the first time the other day. It's Memento. <laughs> 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 this I just I didn't love it because I kind of figured out that it was um. What's her name's boyfriend who did it at the end? Like, she just mentions the name and it was Jimmy G. So I just had it figured out like halfway through. And then the twist of the end where he does say, like, the guy, I forget the cop's name, but he's been making him do it the whole time. That was really, really good and I really liked it. But I think just as a whole, great performances, really, really cool concept, but I, it just kind of fell flat for me. But it's again one I definitely want to watch again. Um, but I, I would say Memento is the hardest one to emotionally connect to in a way of all of the Sims. I'm a John G. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> um, number I do not vouch for the, his answers. As <laughs> hey, show what the hey, I put Memento, at, show I put Memento at 10, so it's just Ooh, one you off. You did put this. Memento at yeah. 10. There's no wrong answers here, boys. We're all friends for <laughs> now. Except, except, for, the, except for the prestige answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're all friends while the camera's on. But, um, number 10, I have Dark Knight Rises, which, again, not a bad movie, but definitely, in my opinion, the weakest of the Batman trilogy. And there's just so many scenes in that movie, just little parts that kind of throw you off. Like um, Marion, I forget. I always forget how to pronounce her last name. But when she dies in Marian the truck, Marion Cotillard. Yes. Yeah. When she dies in the truck and just kind of takes like a deep breath and just it's a drops her head. It's the it's worst like, death scene ever. <laughs> it's just, it's like yeah. terrible. And for an Oscar-winning <laughs> actress to do, I was like, it's so oh funny. man, it's hard. That's a <laughs> yeah. bad moment. I bet it's like the only one they had in focus because they yeah. always shoot on IMAX <laughs> film. They were probably film. like, we have two minutes to get this shot. Just fucking shoot it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I've seen better fake deaths from three-year-olds, but she is an amazing actress, I will say. Yeah, Oscar winner. She's incredible. Um, but number nine, I have Following, which first movie, just iron out the kink, and he did an amazing job. But I think shortest movie, there's a lot of stuff going on in a short amount of time. It's just very jumbled, in my opinion, but still really, really great and worth the watch. It's only, what, like an hour ten? So if yeah, you're looking for 10. just a quick movie, it's really, really good. And then at number eight, I have Dunkirk because it's a really, really good movie, but I really, really like history and it's just not the best at it. Like I love, he took so much effort into putting in real Spitfires and putting in French soldiers and French African soldiers and doing all that. But when you look at the beach, there's supposed to be 400,000 people on there and there's like maybe 5,000 extras. You hate CGI, man. Yeah. There's, like, some, it's, there's some CGI guys in yeah. there. No, they did a uh, cardboard cutouts. No, there's both. Oh, yeah, the little yeah, both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's his one movie where his hatred for CGI really hurt him. So I think that's just why it, it lowers it down. Great movie, just it just could have been better if he was willing to use some CGI elements to add just people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, hey, man, I don't, I don't hate your list. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everyone's doing a great job. Yeah. <laughs> Stop being such a people pleaser. <laughs> you're like, you're, everybody gets a trophy. I'm both good cop oh, and bad cop. I want everyone to like me, okay? <laughs> it's my turn. It's my turn. And um, I'm going to preface this by saying I love every one of these movies. They're all amazing. And I'm going to start number 12. I have Following. It's great. I've only seen it once, but for a first feature film, it's really terrific. It's intricate. I mean, nonlinear storytelling is very... Uh, confident thing to do for your first film, especially if you pull it off really well. So that's impressive as hell. Number 11, I have Insomnia. Again, when you're ranking Nolan's movies, this is a great movie. It's a really terrific mystery. 
lots of great kind of playing with time start starting to play with time a little bit here obviously in alaska uh, there's no there's no uh night at this time of year so it's just like am i awake am i asleep so nolan's always been playing with time in all of his movies except for really dark knight and dark knight rises and number 10 i have the dark knight rises which in scope is one of his biggest movies insanely impressive anthony is angry as hell at me <laughs> look at that face you look like bane <laughs> i love this movie again i love oh, you it. but again of all the batman movies i'm putting it third for nolan's trilogy but the scope's incredible and like uh who is it tommy ryan saying the little things here and there in that movie just like you notice them it takes you out of the experience a little bit of how great of a filmmaker. I mean, he's a great filmmaker, but there's little so you're things. you're saying he sucks at making movies. There's little scenes in The Dark Knight Rises that you seldom see in a Nolan movie. I wouldn't call them mistakes, but more of kind of taking you out of the like illusion what? of being in a movie. Like that. The death of Mar of um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Natalia Agul. Like little things like I that. Agree, yeah. And then some of the background act, there's, some of the fighting is off in that movie. It's a little slow. There's a, there's a few yeah. fighting sequences where some of the guys are like, they're not even fighting that hard. It's like the last Jedi fight. Yeah, it's like exactly <laughs> like that. Yeah. And you never see stuff like that in Nolan movies. Usually he has all that stuff trimmed up. But I think the scope was so big of a movie that they were trying, oh, we got to film, we got to film. Uh, next up, I have Tenet. I really enjoyed Tenet. I've seen it, I think, five times. We did a great episode breaking it down because a lot of people were confused about it and still are confused about it. I think the soundtrack's incredible. It's the first time he didn't work with Christopher Nolan since he's been, I mean, with Hans Zimmer since he's been working with Hans, who took over after, what, well, for Batman Begins and then after The Prestige because David Julian was his composer for Memento and The Prestige. But Tenet's awesome. The ideas are impressive and massive, and I love this new sort of not exactly time travel but time inversion these kind of new rules you've never really seen in a movie before of not traveling technically through time to a specific point but inverting through time which has already been set it's already happened going forwards and backwards this concept of this organization tenant agents do they even travel through years of time or are they just constantly inverting reverting do they ever do they ever leave that point so i think it's a great Bond movie. It's it's Nolan's yeah. Bond movie for sure. And John David Washington's an awesome lead in. I love that movie. And obviously our pets. So charming. So charming. Yes. Yes. And charming. then number one, two, three, four, four. Yeah, my next one, which will be number eight, is Memento. So I think I got a little higher than everyone so far. Wow, you put it over some big ones. I think it's just such an impressive script for your really your first official feature in terms of he made Falling, but like an actual studio picture. He's got like three to $5 million to work with now. He's got a, a solid star in Guy Pierce at the time. He wasn't super famous, but he's really great in this movie. And it's a really complex script, telling it forwards and backwards at the same time, really just one character piece. How do you entice an audience to stay invested the whole time? Every time I watch it, I get something new out of it. I see new things. It's complex, incredible filmmaking. I love the black and white and the color filmography, filmmaking as well. And I think it's a really special mystery and has a great twist conclusion at the end. And I love it. I love nice it so picks. Much. Nice picks. So that's my bottom five of all my favorite Nolan movies because they're all my favorites. Excellent. I like your list the most so far. Thank Good. you. I appreciate I've, it. I've I like yours. Uh, except Tenant. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. All right, Anthony, why don't you lead us off with your number seven on your ranking? I'm going to go with The Dark Knight Rises. I think it's really epic and so much fun. I love Bane. I love this version of Catwoman. I think Anne Hathaway did a really fantastic job. And, and Tom Hardy was an excellent follow-up to Heath Ledger's Joker. Like, how do you make another villain that can be comparable? And in some ways, Tom Hardy's Bane is, in a, in a different way, so fantastic as an antagonist against Batman. But for me, what separates this from any other comic book movie is to see your hero literally get fucking destroyed. Because I, I think Bane beating the shit out of Batman is one of the most powerful scenes I've ever seen in a comic book movie. Like, you never see that happen. Like, to just get fucking decimated by the villain halfway through the movie, I was just in shock. I love the score. This is when Hans Zimmer did it on his own, so James Newton Howard didn't didn't uh, complement it with Bruce Wayne themes. It was just Hans on this one. But some of my favorite music to listen to is the Dark Knight Rises music. I just think the filmmaking is really phenomenal. That opening scene, there's a lot of IMAX film used in this movie, so this grand scale... Um, I just think it's really cool, and I like the idea of holding the Gotham City hostage. I think that was a really cool plan to see. Um, there's no sky beam. There's nothing crazy, but you do need to have some high stakes being the third film. I think that Nolan came up with a really cool concept for the conflict, and I just really adore the film. So well, well said. 
Well, well, thanks, man. <laughs> why do I gotta follow that up? You're gonna move it up your list now? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> still, still chilling. <laughs> so I guess I'm. I like this movie more than everyone else here. Uh, I have Memento. Memento. Just because, as you were saying, and everyone else said, it's a great script. And after the first act, I was kind of like, oh god, like, is this? Am I not gonna enjoy this? And then by the third act, I was like, this is one of the best movies I've ever seen. Like, I was so invested, and the final 15 minutes are incredible. Guy Pierce is so charismatic on screen. Everything about this movie, I love. I love the mix between color and black and white, everything like that. I love the tattoos. Just, like, the decision to have that be the way he remembers his notes and everything like that. I just love it. I just think it's such a cool concept. Making it from the short story, Guy Pierce is incredible. And, yeah, I think this is when Nolan really was like, you want to see what I can do? And he just showed everyone how good of a director you can be. Great pick. So I think for my number seven, I have, and just to preface all this, everything from here on out is a great movie. There's no bad movies. He's never made a bad movie, but the rest of these are like all you're like the prestige. <laughs> solid. <laughs> I clearly remember you saying the prestige fucking sucks. <laughs> it's the closest one to fucking sucking, but it's not bad. Um, but I have. And number seven, Interstellar. Ah, oh, <laughs> so, so you're not going to offend me, guys. Yeah, it's, fine. it's not. Seven, seven's not that bad. They seven's, all, they all no, look seven's at me not like, bad. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> yeah, we're like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't want to make He has a angry. tattoo of Cooper on his back, so <laughs> be careful. Don't let me go, Murph. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this one, as a viewing experience, 10 out of 10. It's incredible to look at. But I think the story as a whole, although there are really emotional scenes, like the scene where obviously he's talking to his kids as they're growing up, just watching the videos. It's one of the few movie moments that's ever made me tear up, let alone cry. But as a whole, I think it's just a little weak in the story part of it. it you know, it's it never did it for me. As much as I love watching it because it just looks incredible and all the space stuff and black holes, it just looks amazing. It, it The story just never really grabbed me like it grabbed a lot of other people. So I think that's why it's a little lower on my list. But again, definitely not a bad movie and just a super fun watch if you're sitting with friends or something. How old are you guys? I'm 22. I'm 20. Have you? Did you guys see this in theaters, Interstellar? See, I think I like think I if did. you guys saw it in, in theaters, it would have been a crazy. It was one of my favorite cinematic experiences of my life. It was like a really special movie to see, like at an IMAX theater. It was I never seen anything like it before. I feel like a lot of people they didn't see a lot of movies like in theaters, and it's kind of I feel like when I see a movie in theater, especially like that, like Oppenheimer was like a life changing experience. I don't know about you guys. When I left that theater, and I was like the first time I was like. I well, what's like, not a life-changing experience for you at the right. theater? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. I mean, I, I mean, Mission Possible, my life didn't change. But yeah. Oppenheimer, my life changed. That's 7 million. <laughs> I highly recommend next year's the 10-year anniversary. See it in theaters. They're going to yeah. do a re-release. Yeah, so, are they? See great. Interstellar in, at, in IMAX. Definitely will. I think it'll change your opinion on it. Not that it's low. I mean, 7's fine. 7's seven great. 7's fine. Yeah. Old Boy's re-releasing this month. Oh, yeah, yeah. August. I'm excited. I'm excited to watch that. Oh, oh we're seeing it. be that. great. Yeah. Have you guys ever you seen it? You haven't seen it yet, right? No. Yeah. Save it for theaters. Yeah. Save it for theaters. That's my top 10 that. favorite all time. Is it, what, did it uh, change your life when you saw it? Oh, it was boy, like changing again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much every movie changed my life somehow. <laughs> All right, anyways, my, like we get this. Mo moving. My turn. My number seven on my list is Batman Begins. I adore this movie. You know, I feel like every time I think about what's my favorite superhero movie, I always go to either The Dark Knight, but also I love Batman Begins, and I think it might be my favorite of the trilogy, maybe my favorite superhero movie of all time. I adore this film. I think the first hour is the best hour of a superhero movie possibly ever. It's an incredible first act, the best kind of creation of a, of a superhero in terms of the origin story, as well as the nonlinear storytelling of Bruce as he becomes Batman, then switching to linear about an hour in. I love Ra's al Ghul as a villain. The music, like Anthony said, is some of the most listened to in my life. This might be my, maybe my most watched movie of all time. It's just a, a ultimate comfort movie of mine. I really adore it. I just it's my favorite origin story of a character becoming a superhero and like what dr seeing what drove a character like Bruce Wayne to take on the persona of this bat vigilante. What led him there? He's a fucking ninja. It's so cool. <laughs> Training in on on a glacier. It's awesome, man. I love this movie. I think it's it's for sure my favorite tech for Batman as well. And I mean, Alfred is my, is my favorite Alfred, and then bringing Lucius Fox in, I think that's a huge benefit to this trilogy of of all the recent Batman's we've gotten. I think having Lucius 
and Alfred together as kind of like the the father figures of Bruce is really important to this trilogy. But I think Batman Begins for me, it's got a special place in my heart forever. It's my favorite origin story too. I think it's the best superhero origin story we've gotten. I think it's great. How great old pick. were you when it came out? This one? 15. 15. Yeah. yeah. We're born in 1990. <laughs> we, so we were prime age for it. Yeah. It was made for us. It was a life-changing experience for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was, because apparently every movie you see in the theater is life-changing. <laughs> what was it, 05 it came out? 05, yeah, it was yeah. two. <laughs> oh. And you didn't see it? No. <laughs> so why is it on, like, on your top of your list, man? <laughs> it's a life-changing experience. <laughs> All right, Anthony, what do you got for number six? Next round. Number six, I have Interstellar. Interstellar is great. I love it. <laughs> Everyone looks at me. Because before the show, oh, yeah, we want to, we want to make sure you're going to get your feelings hurt. Everyone's <laughs> it's so funny. I love Interstellar. I think it's really fantastic. I was, I was so curious about it from the trailer, and I think it's like an all-time movie trailer. That trailer fucking slapped with the music and everything. Uh, McConaughey was unbelievable. It's his... It's my favorite McConaughey performance. There's so much going for it. Hoyt Van Hoytema coming on as cinematographer using the most IMAX film they've ever used for this. And I love space. I love sci-fi. And I just think it's just a flat out one of the better space movies of the century. And it's even though I have it at number six, it's I still think it's like one of the best movies that we've seen in, tw in the last 20 years because Nolan's made so many incredible ones. And But just for me... Comparing it to the rest on my list, I think that the other ones have slightly better screenplays overall. But there's still some really interesting stuff. I love the Tesseract. I love the future that we get into. I love the idea of playing with time on Miller's planet. There's so many things that work for the film. And it's probably Hans Zimmer's best score. It could be his number, his, his best score he's ever done. Um, but that's hard. I mean, it's hard to pin that down too. But uh, because, for a director... To step out of the Batman genre and to do a huge science fiction film again after Inception, it was a major step forward from him as a director to do something wholly his own again, show people that he's just not an IP director. I'm great. great. That's why we're the top dogs, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I mean, he gives the best one. <laughs> well, I mean, he's part of the show. Dude. <laughs> oh. I don't just say it changed my life every time. <laughs> That's just my conclusion to my incredible anecdotes. <laughs> In conclusion, it changed my life. See the difference? <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, I have Dark Knight Rises, another movie that I didn't like. Well, I love because I saw it eight times in theaters when it came out. Then I <laughs> eight, thought, oh, eight, eight times. Yeah, I, I fell in love with this movie. Wow, it was life changing. It was life changing. <laughs> it was life -changing. <laughs> and then I hated it for a couple years. And then as I started rewatching it more and more these last, probably since the podcast started, I've grown to really enjoy the movie. And as much as I don't like Bale's voice in the third one, I think it's his Batman voice is too much. Like that's why I think Batman Begins is his best turn as Batman. But um. Having to follow up The Dark Knight and having to follow up Heath Ledger as Joker and all that, they made it work somehow with a, someone that I was not sold on playing Bane with Tom Hardy and everything like that. And I just think the movie's really well done and I love the ending, except for the whole scene with Robin, which I think is one of the dumbest scenes ever. I love ever that. Played. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Goosebumps, man. You should no, use that. No, no. It's Robin, she's like, I like you that. should use your real name. Rob Say like... I guess you, you don't want to say dick. The, yeah, but the theater, <laughs> fucked, the theater erupted. Everybody yeah. was like, oh! That was fan service. That yeah. was 100% yeah. fan yeah. service. I think we had different theater experience. I don't think anyone cheered in my theater. Oh, we, we erupted, man. Dude, <laughs> our theater was a madhouse. Well, yeah. he always puts like those canon things in there, like Anthony brought Breaking Batman's back. That's a famous canon yeah, event. But fun, even um, the guy, Reese, uh, who's going to tell everyone who Batman is in Dark Knight. His name is Mr. Reese. So Mr. Reese, people think that he might be Edward Enigma in a different, like he might be the Riddler. Oh, it's right. Mr. Reese, Mr. Reese. Oh, no. So like little things like nice. that he always peppers in, I feel like. Mr. Reese. No, I think it was just like being, so, uh, just being like a big Robin fan, like just with the comics and everything. I just wanted them to say one of the actual Robin characters' names, not just say Robin. Mm -hmm. I, but that's something like that's for the mainstream. Yeah, no. It's not I, for comic It makes readers. sense. Like if they Who's said, your favorite Robin? Oh, God. Uh, this is a hot take. Jason Todd is my favorite Robin, which is no one ever agrees with me on. But I've never cried a comic except for Death in the, Fam Death in the Family. And I think 
Jason Todd's so much fun to watch as Robin because I love like the little gray area kind of hero. And just seeing someone that Batman Lee has to be like, okay, you're grounded from being Robin. Like, you can't do this because he's breaking people's collarbones. He's almost killing people all the time. Like, I don't know. I love Jason Todd. So, yeah. I wish they said Jason. That would have been cool. See, if they said Jason, I would have been like, who the fuck is Jason? Oh, my God. I would have, I would have screamed if I would have just been me. Because we, we my... don't know the comics. So I, don't I, would... know, I don't know anything about Robin. Yeah. I was just curious. I would have been, I would have oh, been like, why did they down. say I'm his sorry. middle name is Jason? What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> You're like, is that supposed to mean something? Yeah, it would have, been, it would have meant nothing to me. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> um, my number six is going to be Batman Begins. I think. Fuck. <laughs> um amazing start to the batman trilogy he just immediately hit the ground running especially with bale and liam neeson as ra's al ghul was a great villain especially going for ra's al ghul in the first movie it's a pretty ballsy move considering but um i think he really really pulled it off just everybody in this movie is fantastic alfred's great lucius fox is great um he just really brought batman to the screen not like no Batman has ever been before, like no superhero has ever been before. It was the most realistic and probably still is the most realistic superhero movie just because, you know, Batman gets the shit kicked out of him, <laughs> especially throughout the trilogy, like breaks his back. But other than that, he's just, he has no cartilage left throughout the the end of the trilogy. I mean, he just makes it so grounded and so real and gives a great explanation for everything. It's just a great movie, great start to a trilogy. That's a good point. How he start? He didn't do Joker first. I'm sure the studio was like, "You don't want to do the Joker." Yeah. No one's like, "I'm gonna do my own thing." Even Matt Teaser. Reeves did it in his first one, which I think was a mistake. Now everyone does yeah. the Joker. You know, well, I mean, he, Riddler. He just teased the Joker in the first one. The card was so great. Just having the card. No, I'm talking about oh, Matt the Reeves. Well, they yeah, shot it. Yeah. It was no, great. I know they shot it. They shot it. No, they but like as the main villain. No, but yeah, but they they wanted to put him in there. They shot they it. You know, I mean, they I think they the still made it. You know, what I mean, they made the decision to do it. Yeah. But I think that's a great point that, you know, not doing Joker, the obvious pick. That was, you got to set up the franchise. You got to set up the world. And, and Roz is job. not a huge villain. Like, he's big in the comics because he's kind of like a big bad. But uh-huh. I guess, I get, like, mainstream, I wouldn't say he's even in the top five villains that you would pick. Like, Mr. Freeze, Bane, like, they all come to yeah. mind. Mm-hmm. Not Ra's al Ghul, which yeah, I was Yeah, when you try trying so to make it real. Yeah. Real yeah. into it. Like, yeah. Mr. Freeze doesn't make a ton of yeah. sense in mm-hmm. Bane, world. Bane made a lot of sense. And I thought the Riddler would have made a lot of sense. Yeah. Roz, because he can bring himself and de-age himself with the Lazarus pit. So there's like this whole thing, but I was shocked and it works. Yeah. So yeah. I that think it makes sense going from... Riddler at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I think it makes sense going from showing the training to showing Roz being the bad guy. Like it's just, you're allowed to stick with him throughout the whole movie instead of seeing the training with Roz and then just a whole new villain. So I think that it makes it work even better that he's through the entire movie. I love it. All right. My number six is going to be Dunkirk. I think this is maybe the best war film of the century. And from a craft of filmmaking standpoint, I've been I've always thought it was Nolan's best film until I saw Oppenheimer in terms of like filmmaking. It was just it's just astounding. You know, cha- like Eddie said, changing the genre up of of war films, like you said, not showing anyone getting shot really, just a few bullets here and there in the beginning, I guess. Someone gets shot in the, in the opening, right? Yeah, the yeah, one four person, guys two, get two, shot. Two of them out of the squadron. But yeah. aside from yeah. that, you know, it's more about the, the soldiers themselves and the fear of being on that beach, and then the triptych storytelling is so fascinating. And I know a lot of people didn't pick up on it the first time they saw the triptych storytelling with uh, one week by beach about, and then one hour in the air, and then about a day by water. But just having the the balls to just do that in a war movie at the same time is making a great war epic. So I thought it was really clever. But also, only Nolan does stuff like that, and he's he's got to figure out a way to play with time because you know he didn't do it in Dark Knight Rises. Really, he didn't do it in the Dark Knight. He did it obviously in Inception. I mean, Interstellar and Inception. But he's probably like, ah, how can I get time into a war movie? <laughs> But I, I think it's just brilliant filmmaking. Some of the best cinematography from Hoyt Van Hoytema. We've seen the last several years so much IMAX footage and IMAX film used in this movie. It's exceptional. It's an exceptional film. Great pick. All right, we're on to number five, right? Yes, sir. Number five, I have... Watch it closely. The Prestige. Uh, I think it's one of Nolan's best screenplays. And I just love... I have, I'm a sucker for period pieces in... Seeing Nolan do a period piece is so intriguing, which is why Oppenheimer was so cool to see because he's known for Batman and sci-fi, most notably. And so to see him go to the 19, early 1900s, was just, it's just fascinating. 
I love magic. I've always been fascinated with magicians as performers. They were the biggest shows of their day. Like they were the blockbusters. They they were the biggest entertainers. So it's a fascinating thing of the star power of a magician. But also you have to create the you have to create the tricks and um, spoilers. It's the best twin movie ever. So <laughs> I've I, I, I resonate to it. I relate to it a lot as being a twin. Um, I'm a huge Christian Bale fan. I'm a huge Hugh Jackman fan. And so seeing them share the screen together was just really dynamite. Michael Caine's fantastic in it. But I think it's one of his most intelligent films. I think it's something that uh, it's so rewarding on rewatches. It's a movie I can put on any day. I can watch it back-to-back days if I want to. Like It's something like once it's on, I'm there for two and a half hours. And I never get tired of it. Um, David Bowie is great in it as tes- Tesla, Andy Serkis, Rebecca Miller, and then Rebecca Hall and ScarJo are just also fantastic. And I really adore the film. Um, I, I think it's one of the best on his filmography. And also, it's kind of an outlier uh, outlier until Oppenheimer came of being the, the period setting. I mean, technically, Dunkirk's a period yeah, setting. Yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Dunkirk. Idiot. <laughs> Whoa. Hey. Sorry, as my Dwight Schrute came yeah, out. Yeah, it's okay, man. It's okay. <laughs> Who hurt you? <laughs> you, emotionally. Um, <laughs> so, I've realized I made a mistake. What'd you do? I um I only said four at the start. We're supposed to do five. Do two in a row. Yeah, okay, two, I'll just back, two in back a row. right here, man. Oh, were they? Oh, yeah, counting's I mean, hard. Yeah, it is really <laughs> hard. Um, I did uh Batman Begins at six, and it's my favorite portrayal of Batman ever. I just the origin is incredible. It's the best origin story ever done. It's, I don't want to rehash everything everyone else has said. It's his best Batman voice. I think the Batman Begins suit is better than the Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises suit, which I know is not loved. I agree. Okay, great. And I think the introduction of him in the Batman suit is one of the coolest superhero scenes and one of the coolest Batman scenes ever done. When he first comes down, the guy's just screaming, like, where are you? And he turns around, oh, here. Wow. <laughs> <Back, laughs> Jeff's kiss. But, um, yeah, I just adore the movie. I remember why I moved to my new house when it came out. I was literally just sitting on, like, a mattress watching it on our little box TV, and I loved it. But uh, number five is The Prestige. And I do really enjoy this movie. I'd never seen it before up until like a week ago. And I was really nervous because I was like, is it going to be better than The Illusionist? Oh, it's which, way better. <laughs> which I uh, love. It's probably one of my most watched movies of all time. Really? I love oh. The Illusionist. And I think that's why I never watched The Prestige because I was like... They came out in the same year. Yeah, I was like... They were rivals. That can't be as good. I was wrong. I was definitely (laughs) wrong. The Prestige is ten times better. (laughs) The orange trick is cute. Yeah. The orange orange tree, yeah. The sword uh, one, too, is that's good. Yeah, I I don't know what I was thinking. Um, Jessica Biel. That's what you were thinking. That is a key. That's what I was thinking when I saw that movie. (laughs) That was probably an awakening as a child. Yeah, she's such a talented actress, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we mean. (laughs) Of course she is, Anthony. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, the prestige is incredible. And I know you kind of took a shot at the end of the movie. Like, you didn't love it as much. Yeah. I think the ending is incredible. I love the t- the twist. Yeah, it's a twist. And I think Hugh Jackman's one of the most, I don't want to say underrated. He is actors, underrated. But I think yeah, underrated. I think so. Like, everyone loves him as Wolverine. But Prisoners, it's one of my favorite performances ever, him in that role. And I just, Christian Bale, it's one of the best actors ever. I love him. So, yeah, uh, that's mine. All right. My number five, I have... This is probably higher on my list than it has any right to be. But I have Insomnia at number five. I mean, I just love this movie. Like, I watched it... Um, it was the one time I got COVID. And I was quarantined in my room for 10 days. And I was just watching movies the whole time. And I just came across it on HBO, I think. And I just started watching it and immediately fell in love with it because of the setting alone just alaska in that summer months where the sun never goes down it just looks incredible throughout the entire movie um it, incredible setting and i also love when a comedic actor is taken and put into a not just serious but villainous role and robin williams did that perfectly as the killer in this movie um, I think all around Hillary Duff was great. Al Pacino definitely hamming it up a little bit, but still really fun to watch. Hillary, Hillary Duff. Duff? <laughs> 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 Hillary Swank. That's who it is. <laughs> Different Hillary. Um, gotcha. I was like, who's gonna correct him? Listen and say. Would have been really bad if I said Clinton or something. Listen, but, um, in, in Insomnia. <laughs> yeah. um, Hillary Swank. That's right. Again, she was great. Everybody, oh, the whole cast is really good, and I think it was just a really good 
mystery movie. And I think it, the mystery kind of takes a backseat because if you look at the poster, you see Pacino, Hilary Swank, and then Robin Williams as uncredited. So you know he's going to be the killer. But I still think it was a really, really fun detective movie. It's just really fun to watch, especially watching Pacino's detective character go through all the stuff of, you know, his backstory and how he did some bad stuff in the past. I thought it was done really, really well. So I just really, really like that movie. Sometimes the thing with Al Pacino is because he's so famous and because mm -hmm. he's done so much great work, sometimes it looks like he's just not trying in a way. But um, I think it's kind of just because he's so great, it, it can you can kind of lose the performance sometimes in a film like that, but I think he's brilliant in it. But it's you have to, I guess, I guess watch it a few more times to really see what he's doing completely because I think he's fantastic. But I understand what you're saying where because he's so iconic, He's so legendary. He's and he's in a way he's become a meme. Yeah, definitely. So it's like it, you look at him in a different way because of that. I think so. I respect you putting up that high though. That's cool. That's great. Yeah. That's a great pick. Thank cool. you. You should watch the original too. It's really great. I do want to watch the yeah, original. It's awesome. Yeah. My number five is also the Prestige. Nice. This is one of my favorite Nolan movies to talk about. We did a great episode, and it's one of my favorite we've ever. You're done. great at plugging episodes. <laughs> well, I, well, I just want to let people know. You know, if you want to listen to more episodes, you know, if you haven't, we've done it. But in, just in general, of all the Nolan episodes we've done, that might be my, one of my favorite we've favorites we've talked about because there's so much to break down with the Prestige, and it's a really great book to film adaptation. I think it's the rare exception I've brought this up before, where it's the better film than book. I don't think I've ever seen that with anything else when, when it comes to adaptations. The book's really good, but the movie, Nolan just brought it to different heights. And I love the mystery, and it's complex, the nonlinear storytelling. And Nolan, he does, even though people find it confusing, he tells you the rules when the movie starts. He tells you exactly what's going to happen in a lot of ways. He does that with a lot of his movies, even though people say that they don't really understand what's going on. If you watch the first four minutes closely, are you watching closely, watch closely? Then you'll kind of understand the whole movie in itself is a magic trick, and the whole character lines arcs of Borden is. I don't. Know, oh yeah, we already spoiled it. The yeah. Borden twins is a magic trick in general, and Angier. But the characters are great. The story is great. We've talked about plenty. Uh, great period piece, wardrobe, sets, everything is awesome. Great mystery, and phenomenal twist. Didn't see it coming at the end. It was awesome. Thanks, guys. Right, Take good. it off. Number, number four. four. Number four. I actually just watched this last week. Inception. I love Inception. I always have. I think it's one of uh, Nolan's best films. It's one of my favorites. If I was going to put, um, if I had to rank my favorites, it would probably be top two, actually. I really adore it. It was very impactful when I saw it. Um, I think it was 20 when it came out. Uh, and I'd never seen anything like it before. That hallway fight is still in a league of its own. And there's just so many incredible action sequences and visuals. And the CGI still looks better than most of what you see today. But also, they did so much practicality to, to go with the CGI, which is why it looks so good. It's a really incredible story. Uh, I love science fiction. And this is up there for all-time science fiction movies, I think, in of all, all history of cinema. It's really, really magnificent movie. I love the idea of playing with this VR, playing with simulations. Because that's where we're going as a society. So this is the film, I think, best simulation movie by far. Um, it's an incredible score by Hans Zimmer. Leo is like perfectly suited for the action movie archetype that Nolan likes to write in many of his movies. And he had never really done it on this scale before. But, man, it, he just works in that role so well. And then the ensemble cast is absurd. Cinematography won the Oscar for Wally Pfister. It's his best shot film. Um, as a cinematographer, so I just adore Inception. Still the only science fiction films Leo, Leo's done, right? For science fiction, it's um, the only one. Yeah, yeah, just Inception. The Beach? The Beach, yeah, it's not that oh, yeah. great. Beach, man. not Beaches. Yeah, yeah The Beach, yeah, this one, it's not sci-fi. Um, yeah, that's just a weird movie. It's a mystery movie. It's, Drug, a, it's, it's like it's a druggy the, mystery movie. It's the rare, it's the only DiCaprio miss and the only Danny Boyle miss The Beach. Before we continue, though, I want to say that on Spotify, I'm going to put everyone's rankings. And oh, nice. So everyone vote on Spotify who you think has the best list. So we'll put that. So make sure I'll put everyone's list. I'm sure you're going to put your team first. No, no. Yeah, no, <laughs> the first time. No, I'm, gonna do, I'm doing order of the draft, so I'll be last. Best for last. Wow, so modest. <laughs> I'm so humble. guy. <laughs> oh, my God. Take it away, pal. <laughs> uh, number four, I also have Inception. This movie, I, it's iconic and the entire cast is phenomenal from top to bottom. Killian Murphy, I love him in this movie. He's good. He's he really, really good. He really is man. good. And 
I think I saw him as Scarecrow when I was a kid, but this was the first one. I was like, oh, I really like this guy's acting. Like, it, just this role. Leo, you've never, I never got to really see him do, like, gun work and all that kind of stuff. And he looks so natural doing it, which is made me a lot very happy because I was like, oh, God, is Leo going to be able to pull off, like, looking like an action hero? And he really does. He actually does a great job with it. And just everyone, I'm mainly going off the cast. I loved every single one of them. Christopher Nolan made a movie that I can watch over and over and over and over again. Yeah. You ever right. seen Blood Diamond? Yeah, I've seen Blood Diamond. Cool, yeah. That, <laughs> yeah, he's great. He doesn't look as great in Blood Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, Leo is the most awkward runner I've ever seen. The way he runs, he's just like, got that lanky, like... It's almost as funny as when you see Timothy Chalamet walk. You like, yeah, you know he's got a weird there. walk. He's like, a, he's got like duck legs. He's got like really, his like knees are out wide. Like you know, it's Timothy Chalamet walking. Like if you saw it in public, a bit. That's, that's my one <laughs> knock on him. Is Paul Atreides? Is like Paul wouldn't walk like that. <laughs> he's, he's got a funny stride. It's like big dick energy stride, but also like my legs are too long for my body. <laughs> Gumby legs. Yeah, he's got Gumby legs. <laughs> he's like a stick figure with just stick figure legs, <laughs> and apparently a big dick too. <laughs> Energy. It's got like three legs. Yeah. It's an energy, Anthony. It's a common thing that kids say. Yeah. Um, with my number four, I gotta go. I mean, the foghorn that took the world by storm. I'm also going in Inception. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, um, three it in changed, a row. It changed music. Yeah. That that score changed. Music. Oh my god! It's crazy. Every single trailer for that entire decade was just <laughs> like every time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you guys both said it. It's it's just an amazing movie with amazing performances. Super, super cool concept. Just a dream heist. I mean, it's awesome. It's super cool sci-fi. And the fact that he did so much stuff in real life, like the train through L.A. and how they had to like cover the sun because it, it wasn't cloudy in L.A., so they had to just cover up the sun for like a day. It's crazy. Um, all the practical effects, the CGI looks great, and the story is really, really good. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not much else to say. Just a great movie. <laughs> Plus, so successful for being an original idea. It made yeah. almost $900 million, which is crazy. And I think it's really interesting looking at what it was almost supposed to be. Because when he was originally working on it, it started off as a horror movie. But then he wasn't able to make it at that time. So I waited a little bit and worked on it a little more. It became what it was. But they also talked about making a video game out of it. Which I would still love to see. (laughs) Yeah, he looked into it. Um, He ended up not committing to it. But there is what's what's interesting. There are some horror elements to the film that work really well. Oh, Maul's terrifying. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, the scissors and when she stabs um, Ariadne. There's some horror elements for that work. Really, I would love to see the horror version. That would be sick. Great pick. You know, it's kind of funny. We all picked Inception at number four. Wow, what are the odds? We did it, all four of us. I mean, y'all said it perfectly. The music is incredible. The visuals are stunning. Huge practical sets, like the spinning hallway still lives rent-free in my head. And I love this movie. I love the ambiguous ending. And, yeah, I mean, I won't talk any more about it because we just broke it, beat that horse to death. I do want to ask, what do you guys think the ending is? I think that, I think that he woke up. And I think he's home. But also, I think that it doesn't matter. I think that Cobb, whether he has woken up or not, is just happy now wherever he is. Because now he saw his kid's face. So he's yeah, gonna, I think yeah. that he woke up. But I also saw uh, there was a recent Nolan interview where he was asked at a Q&A about it. And he said, uh, if you see Michael Caine on screen, then it's real life. So I think he up. woke up because if he didn't wake up, that's just more sad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to. I just want Cobb to be happy. But like happy. he said, it doesn't matter because yeah. Cobb decided happy it doesn't himself. matter to yeah. him. Yeah. I think he woke up. But I also want his kids to see him, like his real kids. Even Philippa! Though... <laughs> <laughs> Papa! <laughs> <laughs> All right, number three. Here we go. I have Oppenheimer at number three. I think it's the best film of the year. I think it's Nolan's greatest achievement as an artist. Um, but I don't, I, overall, I don't think it's his best film. Um... But it's it's I think it's gonna win a ton of Oscars this year. There's really nothing like this in st- in terms of a biopic, and he is just firing on all, all cylinders from every aspect of production, top down. The cast is unbelievable. Uh, Killian was sublime in his lead role. I love the cinematography. I love the score. Ludwig Göransson did a really remarkable job creating this music that ties so perfectly with the imagery. I am a big fan of film and I'm an even bigger fan of IMAX film and they shot a ton of IMAX film on this movie and if you see this in an IMAX theater 
especially a real IMAX 70 millimeter. It is just unbelievable. It's so breathtaking. Um, it's just really the film of the year, I think, and it's going to be hard to beat. Uh, I think that Nolan did something really special, and I think it was important for him. And so I've had this kind of just like kind of worrying thing about social media and film, and recently it's just I think it's been too embracing of just blockbusters, just superheroes, just Star Wars, and it got to the point where every time I went on TikTok, it was like Star Wars or Marvel, and I was just like, does anyone care about any other movies? And then Oppenheimer blew up on TikTok. It blew up on social media. And it's just wonderful to see that a lot of young people, they're like making video memes about Oppenheimer and, and dissecting scenes. And, and that's what people are talking about right now. This past month is just Barbie, obviously, but also Oppenheimer, like a period piece about physicists talking in a room. And it got people, got young people excited about movies in a way I'd never seen before. And so that, I think that it, it's, it's such an impactful movie and I'm really happy that it's doing so well, not just with the box office, but for how it's reaching new generations of movie fans. So I think it's really important. I hate following you up on this. <laughs> Every one of your things, I hate it. You get used to it. <laughs> um, my number three is Tenant, And nice. I, I thought that was going to be a lot more controversial than it was, but I didn't see it. But uh, I can say the movie, dude. Yeah, it's, <laughs> a, it's, it's an dope, amazing man. movie. I, my friends won't watch it because like, oh, it doesn't have good reviews. I'm like, that doesn't matter. Why? Watch you, oh my god! <laughs> like, watch friends? it for yourself. Oh my yeah. god! You must remove them from your life. I can't. Oh, <laughs> uh, what's the letterbox rating? No, three point six. Not good enough for me to watch. But I'm just gonna watch another episode of this random show that I've seen ten times. No, that that is my friend. He's been watching <laughs> The Americans for s seven years now. He still hasn't finished it. God. It's horrible. He's you know what I'm talking yes. about. But um. It was the first thing I did when I came back from basic training. I was in Wyoming with my dad teaching a surveillance class, and we're the only people in this huge IMAX theater. And I remember walking out of the theater, I was like, that is by far my favorite Christopher Nolan film. I was like, I adore that movie. I think I put it as my number two movie of the year. Everything about this movie is, to me, just just below perfect for my, my love. Robert Pattinson, he just plays Bruce Wayne with a British accent. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, John Dare Washington, me and Ryan talked about it. He's got a great strut. And the action scenes in this are probably, in my opinion, Nolan's best filmed action sequences. Dude, that's hand -hand. 12 sequences in scene. Yeah, and the whole final, yeah, the final action set piece is, it's, it's amazing. And the ending's so good. It's so sad. And I know, me, you disagree on what the ending is. But, um, yeah, no, I love Tenant, and I will never stop defending that movie. Well, not from the ad. Don't be so dramatic. <laughs> what do you guys disagree about at the ending? I don't think... You know how people think that um, What's-Her-Name's kid is Neil? Yeah. I don't think so. Hey, man, it's not proven, but... It's yeah. not. I yeah. think it'd be really cool, but since it's time inversion, he would have had to just go back, like, however many years just going back, not talking to anybody. So I think it's just a no, little see, over the top. I can change your mind right now. And it's do the it. same reason why Aaron Taylor Johnson's character, Eames, we think is the same character as Michael Caine in the beginning. So, okay. uh, Miss, M Sir Michael. Sir Michael. Sir Michael. Yep. And we th we think Eames is the same guy as well as Neil. So the thing with Ives. the uh, Eames. Ives. Eames is an inception. Ives. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Eames is, Eames is Tom, Tom Hardy. Hardy. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Ives. So when you think about tenant and tenant agents who spend their entire life in organization, don't think about them inverting or reverting for long periods of times, like on a ship for 30 years. Think about it. They're constantly going back and forth in the same time, so they may they, they may never leave the same year because they maybe they're spending a week reverting, spending another month inverting, spending two days reverting, spending a day inverting. So they're constantly just think of a tenant agent just going like that. They never really progress with the timeline of normal people. But they're aging. But they're aging. Hence why Neil maybe in five okay. ten years. Uh, protagonist takes him under his wing and trains him up to be a tenant agent, goes to school, so constantly inverting, reverting. And then with Ives, you can say he never lived past the year 2020. Exactly. Yeah. He just, he's never. He's, he's always been there. He's always yeah. been part of the organization. Yeah. Maybe he okay. runs tenant now. You don't know. So yeah. when you think of tenant agents, don't think of because we. I made a clip about this, and someone was like, "Someone, uh, what's it called when they they <laughs> stitched you stitched us?" And the opening was like, "This guy's he did my bit," and he's like, "What an idiot! This is the worst take ever." And I'm like, oh, <laughs> "Can't wait to see what this guy says." And then he did everything. Not saying that that's you, but the way he attacked us about it. But he didn't think like a tenant agent. They are not traveling 30 years at a time in the future and then reverting 30 years. Right. If that makes sense. Okay. 
mind blown. I think it's making right. a little bit of sense. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah. you. So there's going just like watch this. our episode, bro. So if this, oh my god! <laughs> so if this is if this is time, <laughs> they're not moving with time. They're just chilling. You know, just going yeah, back. So a Sir bit Michael, exactly. we, I like to look at it as Sir Michael. That character is Ives, the guy, the guy with the beard, and he's never like l actually lived, seen past 2020. He's just constantly been reverting, inverting, reverting, inverting, and he's like he's never seen 2021. Gotcha. But he's aged 40 years just every, from yeah, all every his new mission requires yeah. either to invert or revert or do both yeah. constantly. When you watch the movie, protagonist inverts and reverts like seven times. Or and Bar yeah. Pattinson, there's. He's in, in the final battle five different times. And guess where yeah, the climax exactly. is? The yeah. climax is mentioned with Sir Michael in the beginning in the of the movie. Of the, movie. Yep. the stall we, 12 yeah. explosions yep. happens at the same yeah, time same as the time opening scene. The opening. Yep. So there's really bang, like six Neils walking around. <laughs> yeah, there's six Neils. I, yep. yeah. I was counting them while I was fine. It's like, <laughs> it's crazy. man, the more Rob Pattinson's, the better. I was like, the problem I is, love uh, it. The problem is a lot of people look at it as time travel, and that's that's what confuses them, but it's not time travel. Because time travel, you're just being put into a different time period. You're just transported there. But inversion is you actually like move. You're flowing in time and in, in inverted. Cool, man. All right, what's your number three, Jim? Interstellar. Nice. See, I got to be objective about this. I'm putting Interstellar number three because it's sensational filmmaking, one of the best science fiction films in recent years, as well as blending these really interesting aesthetics with CGI and animation with miniatures as well, not to mention predicting what a black hole would look like with the help of Kip Thorne, the physicist. Incredible cinematography. I think Nolan's most emotional film yet. I wept, wept during the scene where Coop is watching the playback of his children aging, and obviously Murph doesn't want to talk to him at this point, but watching Casey Affleck's character age, Timothy Chalamet as well, and what happens in watching the, the reaction to Cooper is just monumentally emotional for me, as well as one of the greatest secret cameos ever. I, I really, I completely forgot Matt Damon was in this movie, and then we saw it in theaters. I don't know if you guys, oh yeah, you guys didn't see it in theaters. It was a massive audience gone we all went oh my god like the it was insane audience. everybody was like oh, i almost god, stood god. up i couldn't believe when matt damon came out of that sleeping chamber holy shit so, what a yeah, secret i'm not sure if you guys know but he was not billed not credited and he was no. not involved in the marketing at mm -hmm. all so nobody knew he was in the movie yeah and then you're in that scene and then you're like oh i wonder who the scientist is just gonna be some random an actor hour and a half in and then matt damon stands sits up and the whole audience was like oh my god Insane. Everybody was like, "What the fuck?" It was, it was like when, uh, when, um, who, when, when uh, Steve Rogers picks up Thor's hammer. It was like that kind of reaction. It was oh, like yeah. everyone was yeah. like said something out loud. Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> so like, just all these great pieces of filmmaking that we've been talking about for Interstellar, the music. I love the third act, and I just love space, and I love space movies. We've had a gr lot this century. We've had, yeah. had a lot of great space movies, but I think this is the peak so far. And Come on, Tars! Come on, Tars! Come on, Tars! <laughs> My favorite movie scene of all time is the docking sequence of Interstellar. The and docking scene is incredible. Come yeah. on, Tars! My favorite scene ever, and I adore it. I could talk about this movie for like until tomorrow if you want, but no, nope, we move on. <laughs> so I was like, Nah, you, that's enough, bro. Yeah, we uh, don't have time. I'll for listen that. to Anthony talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Anthony doesn't want to punch me in my face. <laughs> no, all right, we're well, at number I can't two. Lie. Before you go. I know I've had some bad takes, but I did get skipped for number three. I don't know if that was on purpose. Oh, did you? Jim, I just want to say. Did yeah. I skip you? You did. Wow. Oh, shit. Wow. It's okay. It's because we talked about ten for Oh, it's because yeah. you were talking but, yeah, for It's oh, fine. Yeah. Mine's also hey, Jim, ten. Hey, so Jim, you know, you know the world doesn't revolve around you, right? Uh, yeah. I'm so sorry, sorry pal. It? It's fine. I just want to make sure the people get my full list so they can vote me as the best the best <laughs> normal list. That's all I care about. So number three for me is Tenet. Sorry, yeah, nice. we just went on that tangent about Tenet. No, it was great. He got fired. I, I temporal pincered him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was stuck for him. More like I you erased him. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Thanks no, for letting us good. know. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about Tenet? <laughs> I mean, nothing you guys didn't say. The only thing is that Lovie Gorenson just came right in yeah. swinging. I mean, we watched it together the other day, and the second it started, the second they get out of the van at the opera house scene in the beginning, and it just kicks in with that like synth. <laughs> It's amazing. I still listen to that score all the time. Yeah, I, oh, so I, I, I listened to it yesterday yeah. on the in the on the road. He did most of that score himself. Yeah. in his studio because he did they recorded it over lockdown, and all the guitar he did, all the synths he did, all the percussion. They hired he he recorded some musicians um, via Zoom and stuff, but he did like a majority of that score just himself, which is crazy because they were so limited. 
Yeah, I would walk the halls in high school just listening to that in my AirPods. Just <laughs> alone, just chilling. We would have been friends in high school. <laughs> that's so interesting, yeah. like, to yeah. walk halls listening to, like, AirPods. Like, that's just a weird sentence to me. I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> in school, we were, we like, were, we were, it was, was 2004 when we went to school, high school. Yeah. 2004 to 2008. Yeah, we're old. We didn't have, we didn't have, no, I'm just saying we didn't have yeah. like earbuds. Blue, I mean, we had headphones, but it was it wasn't. Common. You weren't allowed to be listening. You had we had iPods, but you you weren't allowed to. Oh be yeah, listening. you get you you, you, get, you, you get, get taken away. Yeah. Now teachers are way more lenient about technology. Like yeah. our the not, teachers probably have AirPods. Our, net, <laughs> our nephews yeah. tell us that they, all the kids they all just have their iPhones out all day in class. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what? Yep. The norm. We couldn't even bring our uh, iPods, and we had like ten songs on that. But you <laughs> oh, guys could be Snapchat. Yeah, there's no reason to have your yeah a phone out like in class. Like there was no there was no internet on your phone. Yeah. yeah, and also you had to pay for text. So. Back in our day, <laughs> you guys. Yeah, now mm-hmm. we're sounding old. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. <laughs> really aging ourselves on the so show. We're at the number two level of this ranking. So it's the big guns now, guys. It's the big guns. At number two, I have Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. Oh, you didn't put it number one. I did not put it number one. The Dark Knight changed film. Um, it changed blockbuster filmmaking. It changed the idea of what comic book movies could be. And it really created the influx of that genre, but also redefined the genre. It was kind of like a deconstruction of what the superhero is. I'm a huge Michael Mann fan, and Heat is one of my all-time favorite movies. And seeing a Batman film made in the vein of Michael Mann's Heat was just fucking glorious. And this was the first time major IMAX film footage had been used in a theatrical release narrative film. And, I mean, just that opening bank robber scene with that full-frame IMAX, is it was, I was in theaters and my jaw dropped just from the opening of pushing in on the building. And I, I remember being, like, 18, I was just like, what the fuck? This is crazy. <laughs> it's just, like, a very simple shot, but no one is defined by the simplicity of his filmmaking, and that's why it really resonates, I think, so well. But also you have incredible action, incredible performances. Heath Ledger obviously doing his thing. What came, what everything's already been said about him as an actor in this role. I really liked the interpretation of Two Face in this film, and I loved Gary Oldman as um, Gordon. I think it's the best version of Gordon that we've seen on screen. But also, what's really great about this film is the story. The screenplay is really terrific, and I love the third act. How it's not really about. Batman trying to stop a bomb, not trying to stop like a big device or something. It's really about the metaphor of these two forces, Joker and Batman, fighting for the soul of Gotham, where Joker's trying to corrupt the, the soul of Gotham, and Batman's trying to show that the, the soul of Gotham is still intact. And the two um, ships deciding whether they could, should kill one another and ending up deciding not to, I think that that was such a strong way to have the final conflict for the story rather it being just like some big huge action sequence so it was actually a deep story and very resonant human themes for an action blockbuster superhero film but then james newton howard and hans zimmer making an incredible score this is the movie score that got me into movie scores so when i heard this i bought the dual disc cd and that changed everything for me you've changed things forever forever (laughs) And then from then on, I became addicted to film music, and that's now all I listen to pretty much. But it started with the Dark Knight score, and what they those two composers did was so groundbreaking. Um, I just adore this film. I don't think it's his best. Uh, it's not my favorite, but I do see that you can't deny how important it is on twentieth century, twenty first century cinema, without a doubt. Well said. Uh, my hey, number man. two is you also the taste. Dark Knight. Hey, I love your insightfulness, man. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, Heath Ledger gives the best villain performance of all time. Two Face is actually done really well. As much, there's still some stuff I want to see done with Two Face in live action that I hope we get, and I think we will get eventually. But the score, it's incredible. The Joker, the first bank heist, is one of my favorite openings in any movie ever. Uh, the first time you see Batman in the parking garage, me and my dad quote the hockey pads scene to each other. I'm not wearing hockey pads. Yeah. <laughs> we all know the line. And uh, it's it's the perfect superhero movie. And it, I don't think it will ever be topped. As much as I love the Batman, Matt Reeves is the Batman more, this is a better movie. I Yeah. I think I worded that correctly. No, no, yeah. so, you per- so you 
the Batman. He likes the Batman is, more, yeah. but yeah, he recognizes it's better. Yeah, I think the Batman's yeah. more true to my feelings of Batman, but the Dark Knight is. You can't deny the better. It. Yeah, it's amazing. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Well, in the same boat again. My number two, the <laughs> Dark Knight, baby. Um, yeah, I mean, just incredible movie. Let alone one of the greatest, if not the greatest, superhero movies ever made. Um, everything about it, from Heath Ledger's Joker to again Bale's Batman. I think this is the best that we've gotten out of, out of Bale's Batman. As much as he was great, Batman Begins and Dark Knight Rises, I think he's perfect in this one. And also, just again, the technology that he uses. I think the main one in this one is that the Tumblr is kind of divisive as a Batmobile, but I don't think anybody can dislike this Bat Pod. Yeah, I mean, when it yeah. when it comes out, you're like, "Holy oh, shit! Let's here we go, go baby! <laughs> Let's go!" Every time, it's amazing. And, um, I love the Tumblr. So do I. Yeah, I like it a lot. I don't love it as a Batmobile, but as just like a mo- a car in a movie, badass. I love it. Yeah. Just a fast tank. It is. That's why it's so cool. <laughs> it is really cool. It's, it's epic, man. Yeah. Does it come in black? One <laughs> of the best scenes. <laughs> Sick reference, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're linked up again, boys. Hey, I have a dark hey, hey. at number two as well. Everything y'all have said. And more, I mean, it's just incredible. It has some of those action sequences in general, not just being the best comic book movie of all time. I mean, that under highway sequence when the Joker's trying to take out Harvey Dent, it's incredible. They destroyed Pittsburgh and then put it back together. And they said, sorry, here's some money. <laughs> and it's incredible. And this movie's sensational from beginning to end. There's no fat on it at all. It used to be my number one Nolan movie in terms of his best film. It's changed recently. But The Dark Knight is his most iconic movie. I think forever people will always remember him mostly for The Dark Knight. We'll see where the rest of his career goes, but I think this is his most popular film, his most loved film, and it's most common for people to have this at number one in their lists for yeah, sure. Yeah, I forgot to mention the tunnel ch- The ch- tunnel. There's so much to talk great. about. I yeah. mean, there's so much. And, I mean, we could spend an hour literally just breaking it down. Or you could listen to our episode of yeah. The Dark Knight. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> the amount of shameless plugs. <laughs> Link in the bio. All right. <laughs> Anthony, want to kick off the final round of the top Nolan movie of right. your ranking. ranking? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying well cuz I'm trying to think of what yours number 1 would be. I'm so curious. I've been thinking the same thing. You guys you don't know what I haven't no, said? I, I haven't completely paid attention to like your entire you ordering. You don't listen to me when I talk. Well, there's a bunch of movies being thrown around. There's a lot. Yeah. Exactly. I know what you all are going to say. I, but mine's different. What is it? Dunkirk. Oh my Ooh. god, it is Dunkirk. Dunkirk is I think Christopher Nolan's greatest achievement as a filmmaker and um, being a fan of older cinema, this really is, it harkens back to that old style of filmmaking. I actually, even though it, the photo, like you said, the sold, there's not as many soldiers that you'll see in like the photographs of that beach. I don't mind it because it's really about the feeling that he's trying to capture of what it's like to be on that beach. And the triptych storytelling is so brilliant. And it really makes sense for how you're going to tell that story to show the feeling. The whole point of the movie is to make you, is to put you in the shoes and put you in the perspective of each of these environments and each of these kinds of soldiers, whether you be beach, air, or water. And this movie kind of plays like a silent film most of the time. It's just imagery, it's just cinematography and editing. And that's it. And and then music, and it's, it's just the bare and bone. editing, and, yeah. and lighting, and sound. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the bare bones of filmmaking. And, <laughs> You don't need backstories. You don't need to have these soldiers talking about like where they're from and yeah, I miss my dad back home. In Alabama. <laughs> we don't need all that. <laughs> well, actually, that wouldn't make sense for the beat that you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, out in Birmingham, yeah. my dad. And my I mean, dad I mean, owns I, a clothing store. I miss my I miss my dad in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> but the filmmaking is so incredible, and he's a, he's a, such a master of suspense. I like to. Say that he's kind of a combination of Kubrick and Hitchcock, where he gets the gigantic visuals of Kubrick and the grand scale filmmaking, which he, which Hitchcock did plenty of times, but he's incredible at building that tension and that suspense. And there are a bunch of sequences in this, in this movie that I just watched this again two weeks ago, just because I've been in a Nolan mood since Oppenheimer came out. And there are sequences that I've seen this movie six times, and I'm and I'm just in my bed, and I was like, "Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god!" Like the the boat tipping over, the flooding, the I think the best shot of the century. I think it. I think the best shot of the 21st century is 
um, the the lead actor bombs the beach is getting bombed. He goes onto the grass. I mean, onto the sand, covers his head, and in the background, we see bombs, 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 a line of bombs exploding, getting closer and closer and closer to him, and then the last one drops. It doesn't hit him, and then he gets covered with sand. I think that might be the best shot in cinema of the 21st century. It's just so simple, like I said. He's a very simplistic filmmaker. He doesn't try to do that much. You're not going to see elaborate long takes in a Christopher Nolan movie, but he's going to capture that imagery in a different way. I just love the filmmaking of this. The acting's incredible. And in a way, like how he reinvented the idea of what a comic book movie is, he reinvented the idea of what a war film is, and he told it in a completely new way. There's been movies made of Dunkirk, and we've seen the war movies over and over again, but somehow, because of the way he writes and the way his mind works, he gave us something we'd never seen before, and for me, in terms of being a director and a writer, this is his best achievement, I think, bar none. Cool. Sick Great stuff. Cool man. story, yeah. bro. Great. <laughs> Did I not say the same thing about yeah, that no. beach shot we were watching? It's it. great, right? We it's amazing. It oh, my God. Just, just the fact that last one of that one dude behind him goes Yeah, flying. it flies in the air, gets like cut <laughs> oh in half. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, man. But also that, that torpedo scene at night when they get on the boat. It's terrifying. So scary. It's terrifying. Yeah. Plus, I mean, this movie made like five hundred million dollars too. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, starring no an actor who nobody knew outside Harry Styles. But like, I was gonna say Harry good. Styles. I mean, he's not on the posters. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. but he's pretty. He's solid in it. Yeah, he's, he's good. He's yeah. fine. He's good. In it. The, the lead actor. Island? I don't. Anthony doesn't even know his name, which is crazy. <laughs> I didn't know the lead actor <laughs> from Alabama. Uh, ben, um, no, it's Ben. Um, fuck, Finn Wolfhart. No, Finn something. Finn something. Finn something. That's a weird last name. Something. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> he was in that uh, Black Mirror Bandersnatch. I watched, I did that thing. So Finn Whitehead. Finn Whitehead. Finn Whitehead. Beacha. He got the fast thumbs. <laughs> Finn Whitehead. He's very good. He's very good. He's great. He's solid. The whole cast is solid. Yeah. Um, my number one is, I don't think very surprising, is Oppenheimer. And I do want to say maybe there is recency bias and all that. I've seen it three times now, all three times in IMAX, and our theater near our house is the only one in PA that's doing 70 millimeter, which is really cool. So I've got to do that twice, and then just a basic IMAX. But uh, I think this movie is not only his best movie, but I think it's his most important movie he's ever made. First off, it saved theaters in a different way of than we're used to. We're used to seeing the big budget, big IP franchises. It's a biopic about the guy who made the first nuclear bomb incredible i mean you're sitting there my heart is pumping out of my chest i'm sweating i'm terrified and this movie legitimately has horror scenes in it that truly scared me and i think about like just sitting in my room every once in a while just a thought from the oppenheimer comes into my head and just knowing that there was a chance that when they that could lit the whole atmosphere up that there was never a zero percent chance all these different things. The score is incredible. Every single actor that is in this movie is great. The best Green Goblin, Dame DeHaan, comes out and gives them a stellar performance. The, Whoa, best, the best Green, green Goblin? Goblin. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I was like, oh, I was shit. making a joke. It, just, it did not land. But, um, <laughs> uh, everyone. I mean, everyone is so, so good in this movie. Josh Hartnett. I was so excited to see him Love on them. screen. Yeah. And just every part of this movie is so important. Doing the IMAX film ev- in the 70 millimeter, everything about this movie is important. I don't know what else to say. I adore this movie. It somehow isn't my number one movie of the year this year, but. Do you Spider Verse over it? No. I've passed lives over it. Oh, good pick. I good pick. adored. Yeah. I did cry too. So, <laughs> but yeah, I loved Oppenheimer. I love taking people to see it. And I truly think it's an important film that everyone should go watch. I love that. Can you do your uh, your your Green Goblin impression? Can Spider Man come out to play? Spider Man come out to play. <laughs> Spider Man come out to play. <laughs> I love that scene, so I'm just, I'm just, that, that, I cry every time I watch that that whole sequence. A couple of weeks ago, we did we did we were talking about Spider Man, and he did that impression from that scene. And I, it's the hardest I've laughed on our show. I think. Like, Spider Man come out to play. That's the just best part of so your show. When one of you makes the other one laugh, I start laughing, driving, listening. Uh, 
that's nice. Like, that's, that's what we like to hear. We want. We just like. I'm sure you guys too with your show. You just want to feel like. People who are listening just feel like they're just chatting with their friends about a movie. That's the whole goal. <laughs> I mean, friends yell at each other. Yeah, all the time. When the cameras aren't rolling, we're just constantly yelling. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually only contractually, contractually obligated to talk to him during the show. During, during the filming, <laughs> makes sense. Um, so my number one, it's also going to be Oppenheimer. Um, I still haven't seen Past Lives, so I, I definitely want to see that. It's great. But, as of right now great. yeah as of right now number one movie of the year for me oppenheimer and it's just i mean you can talk about the movie all you want the cast is what stands out in this you have every goddamn a-lister in hollywood in this fucking movie and then you have killian murphy who is to me not underrated at all because i love everything he's in I, i'm a huge fan of peaky blinders and all that stuff but i think for most american viewers at least if you haven't watched Peaky Blinders, he's just kind of the guy who shows up in Christopher Nolan movies sometimes. So I think as far as more Western moviegoers go, this is almost his another big break for him. And I really hope it is because he's truly an incredible, incredible actor. And it's it's a sin that he's still underrated. Um but yeah, I, I mean, saw IMDb put him as a rising star. Yeah, I was like, "Are you fucking crazy? Me? Rising star? Rising star. Yeah. star? What? It's Tommy fucking Shelby, man. Yeah. Oh my god!" But yeah, I mean, the movie's incredible. The fact that he just slips in little things like um, the scene in uh, Florence Pugh with the bathtub. You just get that shot, one single frame of just a black glove behind her because there's all this stuff in real life about a conspiracy. It, it's just the little things in this movie that make it so so great. Nolan just put in so much time. And just the fact that he, this movie only got made because Pattinson gave him the book. Yeah. <laughs> it's just such a fun little story. Um, but yeah, I mean, the movie's just incredible. Yeah, I have it at my number one, too, Oppenheimer. And you can call it recency bias if you want, but I try not to like let recency bias affect my decisions. But few movies in my entire cinematic Life. life changing. <laughs> it was a few movies have stuck with me as long as Oppenheimer has since the the first time we saw it was three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, a, while, a long a while time ago. ago. Yeah, we saw it. A week we early. got we got a little early screening at, at IMAX, and then we saw it a second time. We saw it in both seventy mil IMAX, and then we also saw it just seventy millimeter. Both incredible experiences, but IMAX is just an insane experience because it's such an intimate film. And I think it's his most well-directed movie. I think it's his best screenplay. I think it's some of the best music we've gotten in the last few years. Ludwig is such an amazing composer. Like, this guy is unstoppable. He is like the future of, of the sound of film. And it's a complex story to tell where, you know, Nolan's going to get a lot of backlash for this movie, the story, uh, the de development of the atomic bomb. And you got to give him credit for not only staying true to what he wants to do as a filmmaker and storyteller, but also to give a lot of context that maybe people don't know about the project and why it happened. But then, like Anthony said, he made this movie about a bunch of physicists talking in rooms from the majority of the film and then a bunch of delegations with a potential cabinet member and then Oppenheimer with a bunch of lawyers. And it's insane that that is easily the best movie of the year. And... It's not even close. It really isn't. I, I'd be shocked if it doesn't win Best Picture and win ten, eight awards. We could talk about it for hours. Downey. Because... Nobody mentioned Downey yeah, yet. Yeah, Downey's incredible. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, Downey's, Downey's, incredible. Downey's sensational. It's his best performance, I think, in his entire career. And then Chaplin. What Chaplin was my favorite of his, but this this overtook it. But this movie is sensational in every every way, in the practical filmmaking of, of exploring what the quantum mechanics, the quantum realm would look like and trying to stay true to only practical filmmaking in the quantum realm is not just an MCU thing. If anyone's curious, it was, it exists. The MCU didn't invent that. Someone came out for us, came, came after us after that quantum realm. It is not invented by the MCU. <laughs> and I, I'm just still thinking about the visuals, still thinking about the Trinity tests. So many scenes, like you said, just pop into my head and still with me, this movie, even though I've seen other movies in theaters, I've seen a couple other, I've seen like five movies since I saw Oppenheimer. I'm still thinking about Oppenheimer. I've seen maybe 10 movies since then. I still can't get it out of my head. And I think that's why right now I'm putting it at number one on my Nolan ranking. And it's just insane, sensational filmmaking. I, I, I've never seen anything like it before in my life. Mad respect, man. Great pick, guys. 
Very cool. All right. Wow, that's, that's awesome. awesome. I like how we uh, we we had pretty different lists. I think yeah. everybody mm -hmm. except we had a couple two that rounds all, where yeah. we all had the same. Yeah. So four but, we had Inception, and but, then two yeah. we all had Dark uh, Knight. Dark Knight. Otherwise, they were very different lists. Mm -hmm. So it was cool. Yeah. Oh, can I did want to say something on the show. I want to. I don't know when this episode is coming out, but um. I just want to congratulate both of you on Midnight Ruin. Oh, that thanks, is Pat. Awesome. I was very excited for both of you. I should, I'm, I don't know why. My mom probably had no idea what I was talking about. I like, came downstairs. And I was like, oh, my God, Mom, look at this. She's like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I was like, oh, it's the guys from Razor Lost Podcast. It's their short film. <laughs> and she was like, oh, my God, that's so cool. So, yeah, Aww. I want to congratulate both of you. I thought that was really, it's really special. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah so our, our short film that we made in December and January, we've been waiting to hear back from film festivals that we've been submitting to. Finally heard back from our first one got in we made it to the semifinals of the rhode island international film festival and it's a it's legit it's an oscar qualifying it's a bafta qualifying and it's a canadian award qualifying festival so it's like a top tier festival so we're very happy about it so we didn't we didn't win best short but we came in the top four for best short which is really exciting stuff it's incredible cool. so yeah. thanks yeah. it is incredible it. great job mm -hmm. yeah i'm very proud of both hopefully of the first of many yeah and i'm sorry if anyone's curious i know y'all want to see midnight ruin our short film but you cannot until after the circuit of festivals of submissions ends, and then we can hopefully maybe six in twenty twenty four, it'll definitely be public viewing. Absolutely, our show, our short. So just give us some time, and we appreciate everyone's patience. But we finally have some news about it, so that's nice. In the meantime, you can watch, you know, one of our Christopher Nolan episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Oppenheimer became our, our biggest episode like ever. Yeah. Wow, that really? Thing popped. Oh, wow. Yeah, it destroyed. It, it was a huge it episode. Blew up, us. but we love talking about. <laughs> really, yeah. We love talking about Christopher Nolan. We always find excuses to do it. And I mean, how many episodes have you guys done on Nolan? One. Yeah, I what think you just do? Just, we uh, we I want to get more into doing uh episodes where we talk about specific directors because mm -hmm. normally we just do like the once a week. We start doing the film spotlights, which are fun. They're like ten minute episodes, just like short, something we know won't get a huge viewership. But uh, we mainly just do episodes once a week. It's normally a movie we're reviewing. So I think we'll try and start getting more into doing specific directors, specific actors, like how you guys do your actor spotlights and all that, which I do want to say are my favorite episodes you guys Oh, uh, really? We're doing Killian listen. next week. What was that? We're doing Killian Murphy next oh, week. awesome. Hell yeah. That would have been fun. Big breakdown. <laughs> but uh, no, I uh, yeah, I would like to do more of this. So we've only done one, one known review, actually. Do this more. This is number two. Yeah, people Do like more. Him. Yeah, yeah, people love guy. Nolan, mm -hmm. and I learned that people love Batman. Yes. All of our Batman episodes, <laughs> yeah. the <kill>. bangers, <laughs> yeah. comic movies they destroy. They Batman kill. episodes yeah. kill. Spider-Man Spider episodes movies. destroy. Nolan and Batman yeah. always Spider destroys for podcast mm -hmm. numbers for anything. Spider-Man was the first episode of mine because at this point it was just me. Ryan hadn't joined me yet. Mm -hmm. It was uh, we were at. I was probably getting like a hundred listens an episode, and then I did a Spider-Man when the first trailer came out. Did a review of it. And that episode got like three thousand views. I like nice. freaked out and I was going crazy. <laughs> and that so I always like I'm very thankful to the MCU for that. You're like, yeah. I'm rich. Yeah, I was I like, mean, yes, we've, we've got $5. plenty of views. I for made the it. MCU, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've milked the MCU for everything it's worth. Oh yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> also Lord of the Rings. We yeah. and Harry Potter. Yeah, we milk a lot of things. <laughs> we milked but, Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. This was a lot of fun to do this crossover episode. Uh it's posting on both podcast platforms, right? So we're gonna drop it at the same time, same date. And so where can our listeners find the popcorn podcast? Plug it. So you can find, we both have our own pro private Instagram. Yeah. Yours is rferan12. Just Ferran underscore 12. Yeah, no R. Mine is uh, Tommy underscore Cresta. It's the underscore popcorn underscore podcast on Instagram. Uh, stay tuned for more updates on our short film, which we just wrapped filming, which was the effect. Congrats. A lot of fun. Acting's really hard. <laughs> Crying on camera. I'm not acting While anything. your friend is, your best friend's directing you is always a experience. So funny. But we are very excited to share that with you. Very personal story to me. And uh, yeah, just go check us out everywhere. You can find us, Spotify, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter. Even though I make like one tweet, it's always about the Phillies. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, keep supporting us. We're very thankful that people want to listen to us still and very thankful we get to work with such amazing people. So um, yeah, continue listening to our show and for the Lost Podcast. Yeah, and popcorn podcast listeners you can find us everywhere every platform raiders of the lost podcast we film everything on spotify and on youtube and apple google wherever you listen to podcasts we're very easy to find like i said at the beginning of the show we have our own website raiders of the lost podcast.com huge on tiktok and pretty good following on instagram youtube we find us everywhere we talk about we do like four episodes five episodes a week so we it's a lot we make an insane yeah. amount of content but it's our full-time jobs now which we're very grateful for 
for all the listeners. So thanks for tuning into this crossover. Guys, it was so fun to have you in studio in Los Angeles. It was hot as hell today. <laughs> the AC was kicking in the yeah. studio. It saved our lives. Thanks for joining us for this crossover. It was so fun. Everyone listening, take care. Have a wonderful day. And again, don't forget to vote on Spotify who you think has the best rate rankings for Christopher Nolan's. I'll put everyone's on Spotify, multiple choice. There's no way I'm winning with Dunkirk at number one. <laughs> There's no yeah, way. I'm, like, I'm bottom. I'm going to be bottom. Yeah, I'm calling it right now. You're taking that L. Fourth place. Taking you that I'll take it. I'll take it. Win. That's all right. <laughs> all right. Adios. List. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian, Tyler McFly, and Sal Koching, our Chosen One patrons, are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. Notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.